All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to module one of the stormwater management design review course. We will be getting started just in a few minutes. So my name is Manesh Patel. Uh, I'm an environmental engineer in the Bureau of Flood Hazard and Stormwater Engineering within the Division of Watershed Protection and Restoration. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the latest stormwater management design review course. Each module will have a moderator, and today that will be Cheng Yi Wu. Uh, staff will be presenting as a four part course the key elements of the stormwater management design review process in order to assist you in complying with the stormwater management rules at NJAC 7 colony and as required by the municipal separate storm sewer system permits, or as you may know, MS4 permits. We are presenting this course fully online via Microsoft Teams. So before I present the course agenda, I would like to go over a few course rules. One, I'd like to give notice that this module and the other subsequent modules will be video recorded. The videos are going to be posted on YouTube and links will be included on the stormwater management web page for future reference. So please keep your cameras off and microphones muted during the presentations. A web link to our web page was emailed to you in the invite, which will bring you to our PowerPoint slides for each presentation. And they'll also remain available on the web page for some time to be reviewed and downloaded for future reference. In order to receive a certificate of completion and the certificate of the professional engineers continuing professional competency credits, you'll need to complete all four modules, including all of the quizzes. If you don't complete all four modules in this training session, you will need to make up the missing module in the next training session before we can issue you the certificate of completion and the certificate of CPCs. After completion of all four modules, you will receive a certificate of 12 CPCs and a certificate of completion. Three, the schedule is compressed from our classroom setting, so we'll be moving along at a pretty brisk pace with short one to two minute breaks between the individual presentations. Although we're allowing time for questions at the end of each presentation, if you could, please use the chat function for each meeting to answer your questions as we go. We'll be reviewing the chat as we go along and plan to answer the more general type of questions during the presentation. However, more individualized and site specific questions will need to be addressed offline after the class. Although with so many people online for this training, enrollee microphones will need to be muted. I just want to make sure that's emphasized here, but we can unmute you if you do want to ask a question verbally. And lastly, there will be an online quiz at the end of each module. That's going to be uh, around 10 to 15 minutes allotted for that. Uh, you must take the quiz during the time allotted, and you cannot go back after that time has ended. This is in part a tracking mechanism in order to provide credit for the course. After each quiz, we'll present the correct answers in our quiz review. Please try your best so that we can grade ourselves on how well we've covered this material. If you are not able to download the slides from the link in the email, they can still be accessed under this website, which will be pasted in the chat by staff. Here's a snapshot of what the handouts page will look like. Uh, you can download slides for each presentation in each module. Uh, shown here are the individual presentation slides for module one. The links are embedded in each blue box, so just click the box that matches which presentation you want to view. And this is going to bring us to our agenda. The agenda for module one begins with Hannah Mulgary, who will provide the introduction and the federal background. Peter Plianthos will then present the stormwater overview of basic concepts and terms. You'll then hear from me again on maintenance requirements. And Kristen Jeske will present on the mapping requirements from the MS4 permits. Each of the modules include a quiz to be taken online during the time allotted, and we'll then close this quiz and review the quiz questions. We'll provide links and QR codes to the quizzes in the chat and on the slides. It's suggested that you use your cell phone camera and focus it on the QR code, and that will take you to the quiz on SurveyMonkey. If you're going to take the quiz on your computer, be sure to open the quiz link in a new window or tab so that you can also remain on Teams. 
Module two for Thursday will start with Anthony Roblick, who will present the stormwater calculations. Lisa Schaefer will then present the soils testing criteria that was previously published as Appendix E of the BMP manual, but is now incorporated as Chapter 12. And our last speaker for Module 2 will be Dick McGee from NJ Cat, who will present information pertaining to MTDs. Module 3 for Tuesday, May 30th, will start with Anthony and I presenting uh, the Part 1 of How to Review a Project. And then Changi will, will be presenting part two of how to review a project. And then Peter will be presenting the groundwater mounding analysis as per chapter 13, along with examples. And then lastly, module four will take place on June 1st. It's going to cover design examples using the information we covered in the previous modules, plus a presentation on green infrastructure and how to evaluate GIBMPs. Then as time allows, we'll cover some additional stormwater related program updates. The inland flood protection rule amendment will not be discussed in this training. However, when it is officially adopted, we will have a separate training in the future as is required in the MS4 permit renewal. Whenever the stormwater management rules are amended and the department determines that training is warranted, permittees need to make sure that all individuals who have completed this stormwater management design review course also attend this mandatory training. So emails will be sent to those on our completed list of this course, as well as our SPCs. The separate training would take place within one year of the rule amendment. And one very important reminder before we start, after the class is over, we will be emailing out a link to an evaluation survey only to those who have completed all four modules, and that includes all of the quizzes. We're required to collect an evaluation in order to issue continuing education credits. Only after you submit your evaluation survey, you will be sent your certificate of completion and PE credits once staff creates them. That should hopefully occur about two to four weeks after the class has finished. With that being said, we'll start with the introductory history lesson and basics of the permits, which we are including based on feedback we received from our permittees during the MS4 audits. So please stand by while we switch over to Hannah. All right, thank you, Manesh. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Stormwater Management Training Course. My name is Hannah, and today I will be providing you with a brief history of the federal basis for the Municipal Stormwater Regulation Program, as well as a brief introduction to some of the permit requirements that you will hear more about throughout the training. Please save your questions for the end of this section. You can use the raise your hand function if you want to speak, or you can type your questions into the chat box. One second, I'm sorry, something. Can you see the presentation? OK, I'm sorry about that. Shown here are some of the terms we frequently use in our program. This presentation will provide an overview of the history of these words and how they are part of a stormwater program. To start, we'll have to take a look back to about 70 years ago. The Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948, also known as the FWPCA, paved the way as it was the first major U.S. law to address water pollution, and it authorized the Surgeon General to prepare comprehensive programs for reducing the pollution of interstate waters. It also authorized the Federal Works Administrator to prevent discharges of inadequately treated sewage and other waste into interstate waters and tributaries. This is because over the years, our rivers had become increasingly more polluted with oil, sewage, debris, and chemicals. Now let's fast forward about 20 years later to Cleveland, Ohio. The Cuyahoga River runs north through the heart of Cleveland towards Lake Erie and was a historical shipping route. 
At the time, Cleveland was emerging as a major center for manufacturing, and because of this, the river became heavily affected by industrial pollution to the point that it was covered with oil and debris. On June 22, 1969, sparks from a passing train were all it took to start a fire. It was reported that these flames reached up to five stories in height. This was not the first time it happened, as there were more than a dozen fires over the preceding years. However, this was the event that sparked people's attention. A few months later, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, was signed into law on January 1st, 1970, creating the EPA. In 1972, amendments were made to the Federal Water Pollution Control Act from 1948, with the resulting legislation becoming known as the Clean Water Act. It's in Section 402 of this document in which the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, NIPTES program, was created, which prohibits discharges of pollutants from any point source into the nation's waters, except as allowed under a NIPTES permit. Because of this program, the EPA is authorized to regulate discharges into the nation's waters by setting limits on the effluent that can be introduced into a body of water from an operating and permitted facility. NIPTES also established the requirements for what a state must do to obtain approval to implement and operate its own program. New Jersey received federal authorization to implement various NIPTES program components in 1982, including authorizations for a state pretreatment program to regulate federal facilities and issue general permits. This program is known today as NUDGFDES. This is the framework through which the New Jersey DEP regulates the discharge of pollutants to the surface and groundwaters for the entire state. One year later in 1983, New Jersey proposed and published a new rule establishing certain effluent limitations for discharges to surface waters of the state and for indirect discharges into domestic treatment works, including discharges resulting from different precipitation events. Four years later, the Water Quality Act was passed which called for increased monitoring and assessment of water bodies to ensure that water quality standards were being achieved. In November of 1990, the EPA published initial permit application requirements for certain categories of stormwater discharges, which was called phase one. Nearly a decade later, phase two provisions were published and directly affected stormwater management for municipalities and public complexes, which include places such as large public colleges, prisons, hospital complexes, and military bases. Highway agencies include county, state, interstate, or federal government agencies that operate highways and other thoroughfares. If you wanted to take a, take a look at these online, you would find the NIPTES regulations published in Title 40 of the Code of Federal Regulations in Parts 122 through 124. These provisions cover basic EPA permitting requirements, and created a mandate for these entities to develop and implement a program to reduce discharges of pollutants from their respective stormwater systems. These systems are referred to as Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Systems, or MS4s for short. Since stormwater and wastewater commingled in one system, the combined sewer overflows and industrial stormwater discharges have their own separate set of regulations. The portion of the Nagyptes rule pertaining to the Municipal Stormwater Regulation Program are found in Subchapter 25 at NJAC 7-14A. In February 2004, the rules were amended establishing the Tier A and Tier B designations for all 557 municipalities in the state that have MS4s. The majority of municipalities were designated under Tier A, which was generally for the more densely populated municipalities, while the rest rest were designated as Tier B. The most recent permit renewal became effective on January 1st of 2023, and as of July of 2022, all Tier B municipalities were reassigned to Tier A and are now regulated under the 2023 Tier A permit. The Public Complex Municipal Stormwater General Permit authorizes discharges from small MS4s that are owned or operated by a county, state, interstate, or federal agency at a public complex located entirely or partially in a municipality that is assigned to Tier A under NJAC 7-14A-25.3A1 or in a municipality that receives a waiver under NJAC 7-14A-25.2D. The Highway Agency Municipal Stormwater General Permit 
authorizes discharges from small MS4s that are owned or operated by a county, state, interstate, or federal agency at a highway or other thoroughfare, with, including a maintenance or service facility or a rest area under NJAC 7-14A-25.2A3. The federal program requires that the MS-4 stormwater program include the six minimum control measures. The New Jersey MS-4 permit requires the same thing, except they are called minimum standards and are found in part 4B through G in your permit. The six minimum control measures cover one, public participation, including the requirements for public notice, Two, local public education and outreach, which can include labeling storm drains, training on building rain barrows, barrels, and other measures to increase public awareness on pollution prevention. Three, construction activities, which are covered more under the industrial 5G3 permit. Four, post-construction post stormwater management in new development and redevelopment. Under this minimum control measure, the permittee is required to develop, update, implement, and enforce a program to address stormwater runoff, including the plans and ordinances required, in keeping with the requirements of the stormwater rules, which will be discussed further in more detail. Five, pollution prevention and good housekeeping. This includes activities at maintenance yards, leaf collections, and so forth, as well as all of the necessary training requirements. And six, MS4 outfall pipe mapping and illicit discharge and scouring detection and control. This includes tracking down and eliminating illicit discharges of pollutants and outfall pipe mapping, which will also be discussed later in the training. In addition to ensuring compliance with the minimum standards in part 4B through G of the permit, the MS4 permit requires that the permittee also adhere to the requirements for additional measures that are identified by the state as required of a permittee and optional measures, such as BMPs that extend beyond the requirements of the permit and that prevent or reduce pollution to state waters. For more details on these measures, you can take a look at the permit in part four, section I. Now let's go back to the fourth minimum standard from a couple slides ago. The permittee is required to develop, update, implement, and enforce a stormwater management program. The purpose of the stormwater program is to address the negative impacts caused by development, some of which are listed on the slide and will be covered in more detail in the next presentation. Those requirements are also what designers must follow for projects over a certain threshold in size. To be clear, federal regulations require that these impacts be addressed. New Jersey is authorized to issue permits with these same requirements. Therefore, the responsibility to review the projects under a stormwater management program falls directly on the permittee who must ensure that these impacts are adequately reduced. The required post-construction stormwater management program must include certain elements. So let's take a look at what those requirements are. Each of the elements required as part of the post-construction program are represented by a box on the slide. The top level contains elements that are already in place for existing tier A municipalities. Under NJAC 7.8, which is the stormwater management rules, every municipality is required to have a municipal stormwater management plan. More details of the elements in that plan are specified in subchapter four of 7.8. The second box is the required stormwater control ordinance or SCO. TRA permittees had one year from their plan adoption date to adopt an SCO and submit all of this to the county review agency for approval. The rule amendments adopted on March 2nd, 2020 had a delayed operative date of one year so that the municipalities could update their SCOs to match the rule amendments by March 2021. An SCO must meet the requirements of the stormwater rules as found in subchapters four, five, and six. The department even created a model SCO for the municipalities to use as a template. Let's take a look at what's in that model. The SCO must include the design and performance standards for stormwater management measures found in subchapter 5 of 7 colon 8. These standards will be covered throughout the rest of the training and they include the requirement to use green infrastructure to meet the design and performance standards, which replace the implementation of the nine non-structural strategies, how compliance with the groundwater recharge requirement is demonstrated, how stormwater runoff quantity control may be addressed, 
how water quality is to be addressed in the rainfall distribution for the New Jersey water quality design storm, the calculation methods that may be used to calculate stormwater runoff and groundwater recharge, and the detailed maintenance requirements. The SCO also addresses the safety standards in subchapter six. All reviewers must follow the SCO, whether the, the municipality chose to modify the model or create something on its own. The SCO can be stricter than the model, but it cannot be less stringent. If you are a municipal consultant, you must know what is in the SCO of each town for which you review projects. The last citation in the SCO box is NJAC 5:21-7, which is the part of the res which is the part of the Residential Site Improvement Standards or RSIS pertaining to stormwater management for residential development. The permit states that RSIS applies to all areas of the Tier A municipalities. Let's take a look at the lower tier of boxes on the slide. The municipality must enforce their own SCO, review applications for compliance with their own SCO, ensure long-term operation of BMPs, and must make sure the required maintenance is performed, which also includes privately owned facilities for municipalities. The last box also applies to public complexes and highway agencies, and those requirements in the boxes have been in place previously before. Now, creating the plan is not a one and done scenario as the plan must be updated periodically, which will start the cycle over again. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see it says audit by NJDEP. In 2016, the MS4 permitting program began performing compliance assistance audits of municipalities to determine how well they were demonstrating compliance with their permit and where they needed help, whether it's with language in the SCO, following the SCO, or any other permit requirements. And based on our findings, many municipalities could benefit from this process. If you are not following all of the MS4 permit requirements, it can lead to an enforcement action by the DEP. Even if a major development project was previously constructed, it still may not fully comply with the SCO if the reviewer did not conduct a proper review, and it can be issued a penalty with a notice of violation for failure to comply with the post-construction program. EPA can conduct inspections as well. These also have historically been an in-depth and lengthy process, and that can result in sizable fines and penalties levied against a permittee in accordance with the Clean Water Act. These are just some examples of penalties given for MS4 violations, ranging from four figures to the millions, depending on the type of violation. The department would like to prevent this from happening. So this training is designed to show reviewers how to review a project so that the permittee stays in compliance with the permit. This means the permittee has the authority to ask applicants for revisions in order to enforce and follow its program, as well as the permit and the rules. To summarize, we are here for re reasons dating back to the Clean Water Act. The NIFTES program authorized New Jersey to implement a stormwater permitting program for its municipalities, public complexes, and highway agencies. The NIFTES rules detail what must be done at the local level to eliminate, post to eliminate the discharge of pollutants from an MS4 and implement the required post-construction stormwater management program. Under the respective permit, the post-construction minimum standards requires municipalities to develop, implement, update, and enforce its SCO and ensure longer term maintenance is being performed. And parts of this also apply to public complexes. Highway agencies are required to follow stormwater major development rules. This course is a requirement under the MS4 permit in which all reviewers need to complete the training once every five years. Thank you for your attention during this brief overview. Should you wish to contact the MS4 permitting group, the email address is listed on the slide. Before we wrap up this portion of the presentation, should you have any questions, please use the raise your hand feature if you want to speak, or you can type your questions into the chat box. If there are no questions, then we will hand it over to Peter. He will discuss the basics of stormwater runoff, the impacts of development, and the rule requirements to mitigate these impacts. And please stand by while I hand the control over to Peter. Thank you again. All right, hello everybody. I will now share my screen.
All right, so good afternoon. My name is Peter Plantus, and in this presentation, I'll be providing you with a basic understanding of what stormwater is, its interactions with the terrain, and a brief look at the stormwater control measures in place through the stormwater management rule. Hey, Peter, you are muted right now. All right, sorry, everybody. It looks like I was muted. So we'll go back a slide here. So this slide is showing the uh, how the presentation is going to be organized. So uh, the first part discusses the hydrologic cycle and what impacts land development has on it. Second, we'll introduce some terms relevant to managing stormwater runoff. And the third part will discuss the standards found in the stormwater management rule, NJAC 7 colon 8, to mitigate some of the adverse effects land development has on the hydrologic cycle. So we're going to begin with land development's impacts on the hydrologic cycle. Since stormwater is the focus of this presentation, let's define it up front. Stormwater is water resulting from precipitation, including rain and snow, that runs off the land surface, is transmitted to the subsurface, or is captured by separate storm sewers or other sewage or drainage facilities, or conveyed by snow removal equipment. So now that we've defined stormwater and what produces it, we'll move on to what can control it. That is the conditions that increase or reduce runoff. Listed here are some basic site conditions that act as a type of control on stormwater. In many cases, the first point of contact for stormwater is vegetation. Dense vegetation scatters precipitation, making it less likely to coalesce and flow. Rough surfaces also inhibit flow. Steep slopes will have an opposite effect and will increase the velocity of flow. Lastly, the surface material itself and even the underlying layers can affect the amount of runoff produced by a site. Pavement will produce a greater volume of runoff than a grassy field, for example. Next, we'll look a little deeper into the effects each one of these site conditions has on rainfall. Beginning with vegetation. When it rains on a tree, the precipitation falls through the leaves and branches, runs along branches and stems or trunks, and then contacts any other shrubs, bushes, and leaf litter lying on the ground. Some of the moisture that penetrates to the soil can then be taken up through the roots through the roots of the plants. The leaves of the plants can also absorb moisture. And release of moisture back to the atmosphere then occurs in a process called evapotranspiration. Next, we'll take a look at soils. The properties of the underlying soils can contribute to stormwater runoff. Movement of water into the pores or voids of soil is called infiltration. The rate of infiltration can vary with soil composition, and for soils comprised predominantly of clay can be almost zero, while as for sands, the rate can be 10 inches per hour or more. When the voids become full of water, the soil becomes saturated. Saturated soils cannot absorb any more water, so there is more runoff. Many of the stormwater practices used on developments are designed based on the assumption that the soil is fully saturated, so we can best predict the amount of runoff produced and manage it safely. The condition of surface roughness has an effect on the velocity of stormwater as it flows, with higher surface roughness impeding the velocity. The actual topography also has an effect on the movement of stormwater. 
Steep slopes shed runoff more quickly than those that are more gradual and on even terrain provides opportunities for stormwater for surface detention and the slowing down of stormwater runoff as illustrated in this graphic. Putting what we have covered together, we can then discuss the hydrologic cycle. For an undeveloped site, a large portion of the precipitation represented by the largest arrow on the graphic supports vegetation, resulting in evapotranspiration or infiltration, which maintains groundwater flow. Typically, there is little runoff and it flows over land to a water body. An equivalent volume of precipitation as to that received by the undeveloped site falls onto the same site post development. Since the site has considerably more impervious ground coverage as compared to before, there is much less infiltration and therefore depletion of groundwater base flow, as well as slightly less water returning to the atmosphere via evapotranspiration. This site also has a stormwater collection system that discharges to the water body. The insides of stormwater pipes are much smoother than vegetated surfaces, so the higher volume of collected runoff reaches the water body more quickly, potentially causing downstream flooding. Higher rates of runoff can also mean increased erosion and transport of sediment. Development can also cause higher levels of nutrients, like pet waste and fertilizers, pollutants such as vehicle exhaust compounds, pesticides and industrial chemicals, and heavy metals like copper from brake dust. So in summary, the three primary impacts land development has on stormwater and the hydrologic cycle as a whole are, one, increasing the volume and rate of stormwater runoff through an increase in impervious areas with lower roughness coefficients, Two, degrading the quality of downstream water bodies through increased suspended solid concentrations and increased nutrient loadings. And three, depleting groundwater and stream base flow, which is also due to increased impervious ground coverage. Now we'll move on to the second part of this presentation, where we'll define some terms relevant to the stormwater management rule and introduce some basic related information. We'll begin with defining each of the terms on this slide. First is green infrastructure. The stormwater management rules adopted March 2nd, 2020 included the requirement to use green infrastructure. This is the definition of green infrastructure as noted under section 1.2 of the rules. Part of this definition specifies that green infrastructure manages stormwater close to its source which plays an important part in the stormwater management rule. Along with the stormwater management measure being located close to the source of runoff it's designed to receive, green infrastructure must treat the stormwater runoff or store it for reuse. The rules now define motor vehicles and services on which they are operated as they contribute to pollutants and stormwater runoff. Motor vehicle surface means any pervious or impervious surface that is intended to be used by motor vehicles and or aircraft and is directly exposed to precipitation, including but not limited to driveways, parking areas, parking garages, roads, racetracks, and runways. And then the next slide will define just exactly what is considered a motor vehicle. Motor vehicle means land vehicles propelled other than by muscular power, such as automobiles, motorcycles, auto cycles, and low speed vehicles. For the purposes of this definition, motor vehicle does not include farm equipment, snowmobiles, all terrain vehicles, motorized wheelchairs, go karts, gas buggies, golf carts, ski slope grooming machines, or vehicles that run only on rails or tracks. Building on the definitions from the previous two slides, a regulated motor vehicle surface means any of the following, alone or in combination. One, a net increase in motor vehicle surface, 
and or two, the total area of a motor vehicle surface that is currently receiving water quality treatment, either by vegetation or soil, by an existing stormwater management measure, or by treatment at a wastewater treatment plant where the water quality treatment will be modified or removed. Just to note, areas that are only for emergency use and are regularly gated for motor vehicle traffic may be excluded from a site's total regulated motor vehicle surface. A regulated impervious surface means any of the following, alone or in combination. One, a net increase of impervious surface. Two, the total area of impervious surface collected by a new stormwater conveyance system. Three, the total area of impervious surface proposed to be newly collected by an existing stormwater conveyance system. And or, and or four, the total area of impervious surface collected by an existing stormwater conveyance system where the capacity of that convey conveyance system is increased. Note that for the purpose of this definition, a new stormwater conveyance system is a stormwater conveyance system that is constructed where one did not exist immediately prior to its construction or an existing system for which a new discharge location is created. This now all comes into play with the next slide, which is the definition of major development. The rules adopted in 2020 incorporated into the definition of major development the time frame within which the cumulative impacts of a development must be considered when determining if the current development will qualify as a major development subject to the requirements of the rules. Additionally, the key terms that affect the classification of major development are disturbance, impervious cover, and motor vehicle surface. The definition reflects that the department considers the cumulative total of a number of items as contributing to what makes a major development. Those items are disturbance and creation of regulated impervious surface since February 2nd, 2004, and creation of regulated motor vehicle surface since March 2nd, 2021. This is done without double counting overlapping regulated motor vehicle and regulated impervious areas. However, for the purposes of the Municipal Stormwater Management Plan and Stormwater Control Ordinance, major development is limited to projects that ultimately disturb one or more acres of land. The municipality may adopt a more stringent definition of major development to align with the definition in NJAC 7.8 1.2. Just wanted to take a minute to emphasize the situation where a large lot is subdivided into several smaller individual lots, each less than one acre, and each sold and built upon separately. As the definition of development in the stormwater management rule states, subdivision in and of itself is a development. If the disturbance, the increase in regulated motor vehicle surface, or the increase in impervious surface, uh, of each individual lot summed together meet the threshold of a major development, the subdivision itself is considered a major development, with each individual lot being subject to the requirements of a major development. The municipality or MS4 permittee must review the proposed development for those subdivided lots as a whole. Here are some additional terms relevant to understanding the design and performance standards. Infiltration is the permeation of stormwater into the soil into the soil by filtration. Groundwater recharge is precipitation that infiltrates into the soil and is not evapotranspired. Hydrograph in the context of stormwater runoff analysis is the graph depicting the flow of runoff versus the time passed at a specific point of analysis. And then these the design storms, which will be covered further on the next few slides, are theoretical storm events based on precipitation data with an average recurrence interval of 2, 10, and 100 years. So let's talk a little about design storms. Through a frequency analysis of rainfall depths and intensities from past precipitation events, the likelihood of a storm occurrence can be determined using probability analysis. However, a precipitation event being referred to as the X-year storm 
does not mean that this storm can only happen once every X number of years, nor does it preclude a larger storm event from also occurring that year. This table lists the probability of a particular storm occurrence and its corresponding chance of happening, expressed as a percentage in a single year. This is what is meant by the two 10 and 100 year design storms. The top storm listed in this table is the storm with a 1% chance of occurring in a given year. This is the 100 year storm. At the bottom of the table is the two year storm, meaning it has a 50% chance of happening in a given year. Now that we understand the likelihood of a design storm event occurring, keep in mind that one thing we do have is lots of data for these storms. County rainfall data is one source used in the calculations. The link for this data is shown in the header. When reviewing for a municipality, it's best to check the SEO to see if this data is used. However, this is only one of the sources allowed under the rules. The preferred choice for storm data can be found on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's or NOAA's National Weather Service or NWS website. Click on New Jersey on the map to get started. I won't go through all the steps here. Instead, do read Chapter 5 of the New Jersey Best Management Practices Manual, which has the step-by-step -step directions and additional graphics. In the last part of this presentation, we'll take a look at the design and performance standards in place to address the adverse impacts of land development that we discussed previously. These standards are found in the Stormwater Management Rule, Title 7, Chapter 8, or 7 colon 8. As a reminder, here is an overview of those adverse effects of development previously discussed. Under the current rule, there is a requirement to mitigate these adverse impacts using green infrastructure, which acts to reproduce as closely as possible the natural hydrologic cycle. But more on that requirement later. We'll now address how we mitigate these effects in turn, beginning with the runoff quantity control standards in place to address the increase in volume and rate of stormwater runoff. There are three runoff quantity control options. The full text of the first can be seen here. Note that the water droplet is the icon used in the BMP manual for this design and performance standard. In order to meet this quantity control option for a given design storm event, the post-construction runoff hydrograph must be bounded by and not cross at any point in time the pre-construction runoff hydrograph. An example scenario that meets this standard can be seen here, where the post-construction runoff hydrograph, shown here in gray, is contained entirely within the bounds of the pre-construction runoff hydrograph, shown in teal. And an example scenario that does not meet the standard can be seen here, where a shift in timing results in the post-construction hydrograph exceeding the bounds defined by the pre-construction hydrograph. The second runoff quantity control option seen here is unlike the last quantity control option in that this option is a comparison of the peak flow rates for the pre and post construction hydrographs and not a comparison over the entire hydrograph duration. However, the analysis required to meet this option is much broader in scope and more detailed than the analysis required to meet the previous option or the next option as we'll see shortly. The analysis needed here must demonstrate that no flooding will occur at or downstream of the site. This has to assume full development under existing zoning in the drainage area. That extends beyond the site, both upstream and downstream within the Huck 14 area. Because of how detailed the analysis required is, this is the least chosen option to meet the runoff quantity control standard. The third runoff quantity control option shown here is similar to option two in that it is a comparison of the peak runoff rates for the pre and post construction hydrographs. 
But unlike option two, the analysis required is less detailed because post-construction peak runoff rates for the two, 10, and 100-year storm events are limited to 50, 75, and 80% respectively of the pre-construction peak runoff rates. This rate reduction is sufficient to demonstrate runoff quantity control, and the offsite analysis as required in option two isn't needed. This is the option we see chosen most of the time. There is an exemption from the quantity control standard. If stormwater runoff from a project discharges within a tidal flood hazard area, and it's clear that the increased volume of stormwater runoff will not lead to downstream flooding, then the site will be exempt from the runoff quantity control requirement. But it must be demonstrated that no downstream flooding would occur. Now we'll move on to the water quality standards in place. When a development proposes one quarter acre or more of regulated motor vehicle surface, stormwater management measures for water quality control are required. Why is that? Developed sites typically do not have the surface roughness to slow down runoff. This means there generally is not enough time for any pollutants to settle out, resulting in direct discharge to water bodies. The stormwater rule includes design and performance standards for water quality best management practices, or BMPs, and the rules focus on two pollutants, total suspended solids, or TSS, and nutrients. TSS includes sediment and other pollutants that can be removed from stormwater through filtration. This is important because high TSS levels impair water bodies. Nutrients are generally a result of fertilizers and animal waste. The two nutrients of concern are phosphorus and nitrogen because they overstimulate plant growth in aquatic environments, which results in algal blooms and a reduction in dissolved oxygen concentration in water. The current rule requires a developed site's stormwater runoff be treated to 80% TSS reduction and the removal of nutrients to the maximum extent feasible. Also, just to note that the trigger for water quality control in 7 colon 8 is one quarter acre regulated motor vehicle surface, but local SEOs might have a stricter measure as was mentioned in the last presentation. So definitely check the local SEO. In order to meet the 80% TSS removal requirement, stormwater runoff from the water quality design storm must be treated through the use of BMPs. The water quality design storm is a storm event with a custom rainfall intensity distribution that results in a total rainfall depth of 1.25 inches in two hours. The custom distribution can be found in the stormwater management rule 7 colon 8. The gold percent sign is the icon used in the BMP manual for this design and performance standard. Some BMPs remove more TS than TSS than others, so that each type may have its own value or even a range of TSS removal. The percentage identified in the manual is only awarded to BMPs designed and constructed in accordance with the information in the manual. Also, if a BMP is not properly maintained, its ability to provide water quality may be impaired. There is also an exemption from the quality control standard. The requirement to reduce TSS does not apply to any stormwater runoff in a discharge regulated under a numeric effluent limitation for TSS imposed under the Negyptes rules. If there is a separate Negyptes permit, it has to cover the same area and the same runoff flow that would have been subject to the runoff quality standard. Now we'll move on to the third set of standards in place, which address the reduction in groundwater due to development. Earlier, we defined groundwater recharge as that portion of runoff that travels down past the root zone of plants. The stormwater rule provides two options for development. The full text of option one is posted here. To meet this option, a development must match the existing annual volume infiltrated on the pre-developed site. This option requires careful analysis, and unfortunately, 
we still see a lot of mistakes in the analyses performed or in the local review of calculations. The second option requires the designer calculate the increased runoff volume that will be produced by the development from the two year storm and infiltrate that amount. This generally requires a lot of storm to be infiltrated. And this may not be easy to do if a project is going from a lot of vegetation to a lot of impervious cover, particularly if the soil was very well drained to start. Additionally, the brown shield is the icon used in the BMP manual for this design and performance standard. There is an exemption from the groundwater recharge requirement that is applicable to only previously developed portions within an urban urban redevelopment area. Previously developed is defined as areas devoid of woody vegetation. And for an area where woody vegetation has newly taken root, it's no longer considered developed. Just to note, we see a lot of compliance issues regarding the groundwater recharge standards, mainly due to improper soil testing. So that will be elaborated upon in a later presentation. The rules require that green infrastructure or GI BMPs be used to address the requirements for groundwater recharge, stormwater runoff quantity control, and stormwater runoff quality. Subsection 5.3 of the rules includes three tables listing BMPs and how they may be used to meet the design and performance standards. Since GI must be located close to the source of runoff, Small scale GI BMPs require limitations on the contributory drainage area. As noted in the last bullet on this slide, municipalities may approve alternative designs, but they must match the GI definition and follow other applicable limitations. Each of the tables identify columns indicating whether a BMP may be used to address stormwater runoff quality quantity control, or groundwater recharge. The last column is the separation required from the seasonal high water table, assuming the soil testing procedures in Chapter 12 of the BMP manual have been filed correctly. Note that Chapter 12 was formerly Appendix E in the BMP manual. Table 5-1 lists GI BMPs that may be used to meet the groundwater recharge, stormwater runoff quantity, and stormwater runoff quality design and performance standards, provided that the GI BMP is designed in accordance with the BMP manual. Some of the GI BMPs cannot receive runoff from motor vehicle services and therefore do not address water quality, like cisterns and green roofs. Others do not attenuate the discharge of stormwater runoff from the two 10 and 100 year design storms, so they cannot meet the quantity control requirement like dry wells. There are certain MTDs with a vegetative or soil component that meet the GI definition, but not all MTDs are GI. A listing of MTDs that meet the definition of GI are NJCAT verified, and certified by the department can be found on our website. Lastly, these systems are typically smaller in scale and dry wells, GI MTDs, pervious paving systems, small scale by retention systems, small scale sand filters, and small scale infiltration basins all have a limited contributory drainage area that they can treat as defined in NJAC 7.8 5.3B. BMPs in Table 5-2 can be used to address stormwater runoff quantity control. These can have drainage areas that are larger than the drainage areas of BMPs listed in Table 5-1. These BMPs may be used to meet water quality and recharge only if a waiver or variance is granted from NJC 7.8 5.3. BMPs in Table 5-3 always require a waiver or variance from NJC 7.8-5.3 before they can be used to meet any of the design and performance standards. It is not anticipated that these BMPs will be used much in the future because of what is required 
in order to grant a waiver or approve a variance. As for some of the BMPs noted on this table, blue roofs don't have a reuse component and extended detention basins are typically large and also require additional treatment to meet water quality standards. The majority of manufactured treatment devices or MTDs currently do not have a soil or vegetative component, so they fall into this table. Subsurface gravel wetlands and wet ponds designed with without beneficial reuse are listed on this table. The regulations under sec subsection 5.2 F specify that BMPs designed in accordance with the BMP manual are presumed capable of providing treatment necessary to meet the design and performance standards under the rules. However, anything that is not designed in accordance with the BMP manual is considered an alternative design. As with all major, de major development projects, these alternative designs must be reviewed by the review agency and in these cases, the DEP must be notified of the review agency's approval of the alternative design. The BMP manual is always updated to align with the current rule. Shown here is a SNP from our BMP manual webpage listing out the chapters for specific BMPs. The BMPs listed under these chapters correspond to the BMPs listed in the tables under subsection 5.2 of the rule, with BMPs from chapters 9, 10, and 11 corresponding with BMPs from tables 5-2, 5-3, and 5-1 respectively. I got that order a little mixed up, so it's chapter 9 with 5-1, chapter 10 with 5-2, and chapter 11 with 5-3, so that's how that works. And next, we'll take a look at an example cover page from a BMP chapter. As we said, Chapter 9 contains all of the GI BMPs listed in Table 5-1. Shown here is the cover page from Chapter 9.8, which is for small-scale infiltration basins. And it's a typical example of the chapters for the various BMPs listed in Subsection 5.3 of the rules. At the top of the page is an introductory statement that provides an overview of how the BMP addresses pollutant removal and the rate at which it removes total suspended solids or TSS from stormwater runoff. The first table on the page is also an overview and it identifies the design and performance standards of the rules for which the BMP can or cannot be used. This is where you see the icons we discussed earlier for each of the design and performance standards. If you are not familiar with a BMP, this is a good place to become acquainted with how the BMP complies with the rule requirements. In this case, the small scale infiltration basin, when designed in accordance with all of the design criteria in the chapter, is approved as a GI BMP. It can be used to address stormwater runoff quantity control when designed as an online system. It can be used to meet the groundwater recharge requirement and it has a TSS removal rate of 80%. The other tables below this first table, although not shown here, provide additional design criteria explained in the chapter. To reiterate, BMPs are awarded the TSS removal rate stated in the BMP manual only if they are designed in accordance with the BMP manual. That includes meeting the requirements for pre and post construction soil testing and a full maintenance plan which Manesh will address next. A later presentation in module three titled, How to Review a Project, will elaborate on how to determine if a BMP meets the design and performance standards. Module four will also include further discussion on and examples of evaluating GI BMPs. In summary, in the first part of the presentation, we covered some of the adverse effects land development has on the hydrologic cycle, including increasing the rate and volume of stormwater runoff, degrading the quality of downstream water bodies, and depleting groundwater. In the final part of this presentation, we briefly covered the design and performance standards in place to mitigate some of the adverse effects of land development. 
standards such as the three water quantity control options, the water quality requirement to remove 80% of the total suspended solids and nutrients to the maximum extent feasible, the two groundwater recharge options, and the requirement to meet those three standards using green infrastructure. Thanks everybody for your attention. Should you wish to contact me, here's my information. And let's check if there are any questions and see where we are at with time. So uh, it looks like everybody is putting their questions into the chat. So we will continue with our next presentation which is Manesh with maintenance of stormwater management measures. So please stand by while Manesh uh, takes over. Actually, we will be taking a five minute break here. So go ahead, stretch out, step away for a little bit, and we're gonna resume at 2.07. Additionally, we have four different parties who have joined via phone and I'll need to know who's on the phone chat with you. So if you can access the chat, please let us know. Otherwise, please send an email to the DWQ uh, email account so that all of us uh, can see it and give you credit for attending the class. Hello, um, can you hear me OK? Uh, yeah, um, I'm unfortunately I can't see which phone number is talking. So, um, 732-856-2386, Dane Irving. Oh, hi, Dane. Um, my office, see. we're having a bit of a, an internet problem. Um, I think so it's happening in quite a lot of places. Um, I noticed that, um, we had trouble, or I had trouble yesterday. All right, Dane, you said your last name was Irving? Yes. Okay. Uh, and what uh, municipalities do you cover? Halden, New Jersey. Halden? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else watching with you? Not with me, but I had a couple colleagues in my office who are, they've been watching on their own computers and they're in okay. down as well. Right. Oh, okay. Um, OK, well, we are able through the survey monkey for the quizzes to tell who is able to complete a quiz. So I guess we'll soldier on and figure that out. Um, but go ahead and take your break and I have you on the list. Is there anyone else? Um, let's see, we have hands raised. Um, Hello, Mr. Welter. Yes, how are you doing today? OK. A quick question. I have uh, three oh. other guys that are watching the this um, webinar with me. Um, do uh -huh. they also get credit or? As long as they each individually do a quiz either on their own computer through the links or by using their smartphone. OK, all right. And uh, I sorry, just, I have to add something that they did they register. Yeah, that's the other thing. They have to be registered. I don't, yeah, no, if I, they I didn't, didn't register. We cannot give them credit. OK, no problem. Then they'll just watch it just to so they have the information. I just clicked on the survey and it's not coming up. Oh, no, right now the quiz is closed. We will oh. open it when it's time to take the quiz. Oh, OK, um, I'm sorry. I thought I heard someone say that the quiz is open. No, no, no. We'll open it at the appropriate time. OK, thank you. Uh huh. All right. Anyone else uh, who is? I have Scott Thomas for Franklin Township and Kevin, last name begins with an O. Anyone else? OK, thanks everyone. Oh wait, we have Jeffrey Smith. Can you unmute yourself? Hi, how you doing? I just okay. had one quick question. Um, each module counts for three credits each, so we'll get a total of 12 credits after this is all done with the four modules. Uh, we do our timekeeping and we look at that the time that we used. Yep, but that's usually what happens. Um, OK, yeah, it's it's based on 50 minutes of instructional time. 
Okay, yeah, I'm 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 just curious because I I'm you know I'm trying to yeah. figure out my credits for my PE license and I got a couple other licenses, so I'm trying to see what uh how many credits I'm going to get from this. That's all. Understood. Um, that's why we include the review of the quizzes as counting uh, towards um, those credits because it is instructional. Helps clarify any miscommunications or misunderstandings, and we welcome questions like you know on on that material if it's still not clear. Okay, so if you're all set, then can you lower your hand? And if not, then okay, it looks like you're all set. Anyone else? Okay, please take your break and we'll meet back momentarily. All right, everyone, welcome back. Hopefully you had a good break. Um, we're going to get started here again. So, so far we've covered the history of stormwater regulations and the basics of the MS4 permit. You may recall from earlier the slide with the five post-construction stormwater management program requirements. One of them is to ensure the long-term operation and maintenance of BMPs. So let's get into that a little bit more. First, we'll look at why maintenance is so important. Uh, second, we'll take a look at the historical background for the responsibility of ensuring maintenance. 
Then we'll get into the responsibilities of the tier A municipality, the public complex, or a highway agency. And finally, we'll go over what should be in the maintenance plan and how you should be reviewing it. So BMPs are pollutant removal mechanisms, as you know, and if they stop working according to design or if they even fail, there could be serious consequences that impact the environment. Since BMPs are designed to remove trash, debris, and sediment, they can often get clogged if maintenance is not performed. That means the drain time of a parking lot, for example, or whatever else is upstream may even be longer, which can cause flooding. All this is stuff we really want to avoid. I can't hear you. Please stand by. I will switch over. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hear you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Apologize for that. Since BMPs are designed to remove trash, debris, and sediment, they can often get clogged if maintenance is not performed. That means the drain time of a parking lot, uh, for example, for example or, or whatever, whatever else, else is upstream, is upstream may, be may be even longer, longer which, which can, can cause flooding. flooding. So, so it can, it can be a piece of takes, takes long longer to drain, which can lead to We can't hear you. Thank you. Uh, we apologize. Teams is apparently switching people off, so I appreciate your letting us know. So to continue, plus they can attract unwanted wildlife or can even lead to complaints from the public. And all of this is stuff we really want to avoid. So here are a couple examples of poorly maintained BMPs. The top image here has trash and vegetation collecting in it. Uh, so when another storm occurs, particulates will be transported downstream. And if you look at the bottom picture the, in the lawn depression, it's not draining properly. So this inundation could result in bare soil areas and wind erosion when this depression dries out. But if it doesn't drain, then algae could become established and this could prevent, say, if this were an infiltration basin, from properly draining. Here are a couple examples of properly maintained BMPs. The top picture is of a rain garden and the bottom is a green roof. Both are well maintained and clear of any debris and trash. There's no visible signs of improper drainage that would compromise the BMP's functionality. So these are just some nice examples of maintenance here for you. So here's a question for all of you. So based on what you see here alone from the same site, right? Does this look like a ponded infiltration basin or a constructed wetland? It's a rhetorical question. If you visited this site without knowing what was designed, you might think, oh, everything's okay. However, we've seen the plans and this was actually approved as an infiltration basin. Now, based on the presence of the wetland vegetation that you see on the right and the standing water in both images, uh, the right type of maintenance was obviously not performed or something else happened. And so this is why the site became this impoundment or wetland that you see now. So at this point, the basin would need repairs or even retrofitting to correct this uh, impoundment. So when BMPs are improperly maintained or neglected, the consequences can include water quality impairment, potential flooding issues, failing embankments or the potential for safety concerns, erosion, health issues that could occur from, say, for example, mosquitoes, like was mentioned earlier, or even financial impacts such as decreased property value. So these can become a headache for a permittee, which is why proper maintenance needs to be performed. 
So let's take a look at the historical background for performing maintenance and then we'll go forward. So the responsibility to perform maintenance is not a new requirement, as you can see from the 1990s stormwater control ordinance model. The ordinance is designed to comply with the maintenance requirements in the stormwater management rules. An intent of this was to establish responsibility for continued maintenance, repair, and safety of stormwater management facilities before they're even constructed. The model ordinance issued in 1990 has required the responsible party to be the property owner of the project, a government entity, or other legally established entity, such as a homeowner association. It does not impose the responsibility on a homeowner of a single lot unless the homeowner owns all of the lots in that development. So the responsible party should not be a single homeowner. The model stormwater control ordinance stated that an individual owner of a single lot in a development cannot be responsible for the maintenance of the stormwater management system of an entire development. The responsible party must be a homeowners association or similar permanent entity. And we'll take a look at some examples of this a little later on in this presentation. So just keep that in mind. Well then, well, what are the permit requirements requiring, uh, regarding maintenance of stormwater BMPs? So as was previously mentioned, the Tier A public complex and highway agency permits require that the permittee ensure that adequate cleaning, long-term operation, and maintenance of BMPs takes place. Under the Municipal Post-Construction Stormwater Management Program, you can start with an inspection program that includes notification of the responsible parties. So a municipality can opt to enact penalty provisions into its ordinances as a step towards enforcing compliance, or they can even create a licensing program to offset the inspection costs or something similar. The permit requirements for ensuring long-term cleaning, operation, and maintenance provided are divided into two classes based on the ownership or operational status for the Tier A public complex and highway agency permits. The first group is facilities owned and operated by a municipality. They can be, for example, a town hall or a library complex like that. The four elements required for this group are shown here, and they're found in Part 4, Section C1 of the Tier A permit, Section C3 for a public complex permit, and Section C2 for the highway agency permit. Inspection and maintenance must follow the plans or be performed more frequently than stated on the plans. A logbook must or needs to be maintained to show compliance with this section. So if you're looking for more specifics, there are more details of this in the permit, which you can also read about uh, on your own. So continuing on, the permittee also must certify annually that these facilities are properly functioning. And lastly, improperly functioning facilities where repairs were not made must be documented and prioritized, so a schedule must be maintained. The permit citations are here in the parentheses for the TRA public complexes and highway agency permits respectively. The second group consists of those facilities not owned or operated by the municipality. So examples of this could include a retail complex or even a housing development. The permit requirements are found in Part 4, Section C, for facilities not owned or operated by the permittee. And this is not a new requirement, but the way it is now um, it written is to clarify what had been required previously. The permittee is required to ensure maintenance is performed according to the plan or even more frequently than the plan states and a logbook must be maintained of the actions taken to enforce compliance and these details that are shown are required. Again, for more information on this subject, please refer to the respective permit. Compliance with the permit 
requirement to ensure long-term cleaning, operation, and maintenance starts with the reviewer assessing the plans. Otherwise, the BMP may not even function as intended or its performance may decline. So approving a weak maintenance plan creates potential problems for the permittee to enforce the performance of maintenance and may lead to the possibility of a permit violation. The review is a key element to ensuring long-term operation and maintenance. For reference, the SCO includes the detailed requirements for a maintenance plan, and these are also found in the Stormwater Management Rules, or NJAC 7-8. The BMP manual also includes further details if you want additional references. So if you are using the review checklist from the Tier A guidance document, the maintenance portion starts at the bottom of page 17. So what you see here are crop, uh, crop snapshots from the two pages just to get the information into a single page. Uh, section C here applies to the Tier A, public, complex, and highway. We lost you again. Nope. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so I can hear you now, Lisa. Thank you. All right. So I'll show you some more documents that are available online that will help you uh, in your review of the maintenance plans. So there's also more information uh, in Chapter 4.1 of the Tier A guidance document for the stormwater facilities maintenance. This table is part of that which uh, from the chapter that lists the implementation schedule for the minimum standards for a tier A MS4. Another part listing more of the minimum standards, and I'm not going to read these to you, but they're certainly here uh, to re assist the reviewers. And the final part shown here is with more minimum standards. So the permit language is also very similar for the public complexes and highway agencies. We just have not yet prepared a guidance document for those uh, permits. All right, so to put things into perspective, an inadequate review can really wreck things, right? It's gonna jam up these gears. So the duties of the three parties shown um, have to mesh together so not requiring the details of the maintenance plan pushes the burden onto the stormwater coordinator or DPW facilities maintenance office, or it can even create an issue, or it can even create an issue for DEP enforcement. Now for some examples, this is a judgment that was issued against a municipality and the responsible party for not enforcing the stormwater management plan that was approved by the municipality. A lot of complaints had been made because the maintenance on an infiltration basin was not being properly performed. And this is what led to basin clogging, odors and flooding of a neighbor, which is something really that we all want to avoid from happening. All right, since we want to avoid legal issues like that, let's talk about what should be in a maintenance plan so that we know what to look for when reviewing a maintenance plan. I'm gonna start with general information, give you some examples of what a plan should not look like, and then I'll get into some more specifics. So the rules specify the maintenance plan must include details for the design shown on the construction plans a list of tasks and the schedule for performing these tasks plus the cost estimates of performing the tests are required. The name and contact information for the responsible party must be clearly shown. So this person or even a party uh, must perform both types of maintenance. So let's review what falls under preventative versus corrective maintenance. The first type of maintenance is preventative. So that's the regular tasks that keep the BMP functioning as it was intended to be. So this can involve your quarterly inspections, grass cutting when it's appropriate, trash clearing, replacing vegetation that's failing to thrive, and even snow removal. Corrective actions are those that may 
be needed should failure start to occur, such as periodic replacement of the sand bed in a sand filter, or it could even be in response to a major event, such as a major rainstorm, a drought, maybe a car accident, or even a high wind event, just to name a few. The plan must require that a logbook of all maintenance activities be kept so that the inspection can confirm that this is being done. The inspection records what, uh, I'm sorry, the inspection records must be reviewed annually. They might even give clues uh, that something is starting to fail or just not working properly. The review should confirm that an annual evaluation of the plan is specified. And then during the inspection, the permittee should confirm that this is taking place. Chapter 8 of the BMP manual focuses on maintenance, and in particular, you'll want to look at page 2. On page 3 are other items for consideration and the procedures that must be followed. Retrofitting information can be found on the next page of Chapter 8, uh, so that you can also take a look at that uh, at your leisure. Now, Chapters 9, 10, and 11 include specific maintenance details for each type of BMP that the subchapter covers. So, for example, there are specific maintenance tasks associated with a small scale bioretention system, and you would have biweekly inspections and perimeter grass mowing, uh, just to name a few. Another example is if you are doing a uh, green infrastructure with plantings, you would need to make sure that they are all being watered, especially in the first year when maintenance will have a higher uh, rate of, you know, you'll have to pay more attention to it. All right. Now, I mentioned procedures that are to be followed. So one such procedure is the requirement to record on the deed information about the maintenance plan, and that includes identifying the responsible party. So that's the name, the address, and the phone number. The maintenance plan must be recorded with the parcel where the stormwater management measure is located. Any change in the responsible party information, say due to a change in property ownership, must also be recorded on the deed. And the information must also be updated after project construction is completed. Now, if a maintenance plan is too many pages to be recorded, you can record only the cover page and the pages that have the information of the names of the development, the name of the responsible party, the contact information and the types, locations of stormwater BMPs, and the last revision date. But please do not confuse the recordation of a maintenance plan with the requirement of deed notice. They are separate requirements. Recordation of a maintenance plan cannot be sub a substitute for the deed notice. So now let's look at some bad examples. All right. So if the stormwater management plan consists of a single sheet or is part, you know, a corner of a plan sheet, that's a red flag for you as the reviewer. Remember, the rules require schedules of the various types of tasks, the equipment list, and the cost information, along with a logbook to record the actions performed. So there's no way a complete record can be made on a plan sheet, nor would the maintenance staff actually record op observations and completed tasks here on those plans. So this would be an example of a very weak plan, and therefore the reviewer has the authority to request revisions so that the permittee can comply with the requirements of the permit. All right, now imagine you're reviewing a 55 page maintenance plan for a constructed wetlands and you open the table of contents to see this. Okay, so you might think, okay, they have a 55 page plan, so they have preventative procedures. But you know what, if you look closely, you're gonna see a heading for grass cutting, mechanical components, and stormwater detention facility in what, A, F, and H on this list. So that's indica indicating that you uh, have a maintenance plan that doesn't really reflect the actual design, oh, wow. and therefore you can request revisions. So what this illustrates just... is that the reviewer has a responsibility to check the details provided in the plan so that the permittee meets the permit requirement to ensure long-term operation and maintenance. Oops, sorry. Uh, in this case, this is an actual approved maintenance plan that had absolutely nothing to do with the constructed wetlands shown on the approved plan. Sorry about that. All right, so think of it this way. 
a good maintenance plan is going to contain three essential pieces, the information, planning, and education. So from the maintenance plan, the reviewer and maintenance staff must be able to know what to look for, where the BMPs are located and how to get there, when and how to perform the maintenance tasks, and what training is needed to successfully follow this plan. Under the information section, a complete inventory of the various uh, BMPs should be provided, including the type, the location, and any of the outfalls. So it should be easy to find the water surface elevation for normal conditions, as well as the design storms in relationship to visible elements in the BMP, if it stores or attenuates the discharge of stormwater. In this case, the drain down time should also be included. If there is an infiltration component, what is the benchmark permeability rate or uh, saturated soil hydraulic conductivity so that the maintenance staff can check whether the system is failing? And if there's a manufacturer treatment device, you'll need included with the plan. The second essential element is planning, and that's what paints a complete picture of what should be done by maintenance personnel. Now, we wouldn't want someone to say, for example, mow a bioretention system that has a meadow, thinking it was just an overgrown detention basin that was grass. Okay, Planning includes the schedule of tasks, the tools that are needed, access information, where sediment or trash is to be taken, and if it requires dewatering, where that is going to occur. If there's an internal component and it is destroyed by, say, a large storm, maintenance staff should be able to correctly repair or replace it. Now, I mentioned collected sediment. Planning includes how to transport it and what information, such as a receipt, that must be retained. Planning includes the individual costs plus the annual costs for each task. Make sure this information is part of the maintenance plan when you review. The third element is education. Maintenance staff must be trained on safety measures, inspection methods, the various tasks, and the use of appropriate tools and equipment. Maintenance must also know what to record and where to file the records. Education includes knowing what records to keep and always keep a backup of the records in another location. You never know if the original records could be destroyed somehow. Okay, so this the permit even requires all approved maintenance plans be kept on file for review by the DEP. And this does happen. All right, now that the reviewer has checked uh, the maintenance plans for accuracy, it's important to know whom this responsible party should be so that they can be contacted when an issue arises. For a public complex or highway agency, the permittee is this party. Under the Tier A permit, it can be different people or one or more organizations. Obviously, it should be the developer during construction or a public entity where appropriate. Transfer of the responsibility can be to a homeowners association in a residential development, an owner or tenant in a non-residential development, another public agency, and only to a single homeowner or tenant in the event the individual is the sole owner of the entire residential development. So if you take a look at NJAC 7.8-5.8C, it actually expressly forbids assigning responsibility to a single homeowner in a residential setup. So no homeowner can be held responsible for maintaining a basin in a residential development unless that homeowner owns the entire development. All right, so speaking of this, let's look at some examples of how this is applied. All right, so these are some scenarios. Of who is the responsible party uh, sh uh, who it should or shouldn't be uh, that you may see when you review a project? In example one, uh, we're going to think about that, and um, and then I'll read. All right, so first example: a five lot subdivision has one BMP that is collecting stormwater runoff from all five lots. This BMP is on one of the five lots. Can that lot owner be a responsible party for the maintenance of this BMP? Think about that, and now I'm going to say, all right, 
The so second example is a five lot subdivision that has five BMPs with one per lot. They only collect and treat runoff generated from their respective lot. So can the respective homeowner um, be responsible, be the responsible party for the BMP that's on their lot? Well, the answer uh, to both questions is actually the same, and it's no. An individual homeowner cannot be the responsible party for the BMP located in their own lot or a separate lot unless the individual homeowner owns all of the lots. All right, let's do a third. All right, uh, development um, of one lot that doesn't propose any subdivision and is a major development has one singular homeowner. Can this homeowner be the responsible person for maintenance of the BMP that is proposed for this development? Well, in this case, the answer is yes. The difference between this example and examples one and two is that in this one, the homeowner is the sole owner of the entire development. And that's the big key uh, to this subject. You've got to own the whole thing to be the responsible party. All right, so let's move on. Um, we have um, we know that a good maintenance plan is going to include a lot of information. So um, my supervisor created various templates for use by a designer, and these templates can be customized. But they're also created in such a way that they can be used as a teaching tool for reviewers and maintenance inspectors alike. Currently, they're being updated to reflect the new GI rules, so you can stay tuned for updated versions of these, uh, but they'll be very helpful for you uh, when you're conducting your reviews. So here's a representative sample of the various templates that could be used in a project. And anyone going to the department's website, uh, you can click on maintenance guidance and um, let's see um, so we have one person in the lobby um, at the top of the page there'll be an interview uh, uh, introductory video and templates and then there's also the field uh, manual section so this in particular is one of the field manuals and its first surface infiltration basin. So each BMP should have its own field ma manual because each of them has different functions and components that need to be inspected and maintained. The field manual templates include the components as shown on the left. Um, obviously an overview, basic design info, visual aids to help you inspect it, additional reference documents, the checklists and uh, identification of the actions that are required, plus the preventative maintenance record and the corrective maintenance record. All right, so the designer is the person who modifies the complete, uh, contents of the field manual template with the design information, um, and then the reviewer makes sure this information is correct. The responsible party is the one who follows the field manual to perform the maintenance. And then the municipality, depending on the ownership status, then follows the permit requirements to ensure maintenance is performed. So the reviewer should also make sure the inspection checklist has been customized to match design features on the construction plan and in the stormwater management report. So this is a partial screen capture of the infiltration basin inspection checklist log that can be found online in the maintenance guidance section of the tier A guidance document. Again, these are currently being updated, so you may uh, see newer versions um, at some point. Here's another partial screen capture, and this is of the infiltration basin preventative maintenance. Logbooks are also available on the web page for recording both the preventative and corrective maintenance tasks that are performed by field personnel under the heading of maintenance logs and inspection records. And these are what the maintenance staff may look at during periodic checkups of the maintenance records. So for our municipal reviewers, if a private party applicant is missing logbooks, show them where to find the templates and then have them use them to make it easier on the municipal inspectors. All right, so this is all found at the link at the top of this slide. 
Um, this is also a screenshot of the uh, recent updates to the maintenance web page. So de definitely check it out if you haven't seen it in a while. All right, it's very useful and it's highly recommended by all of us and spells things out very well uh, with detail on what you need to do if you're having trouble and uh, or need help or if you have questions on what to do. And you should be able to find your answers here. And if not, email us, please. So there are even links uh, on the web page to further training as well as videos that you can take a look at uh, on your own time. So to sum out, sum up without proper long-term maintenance the bmps may not continue to function as designed and that results to impacts to the environment the permittee is required to ensure long-term operation and that and that maintenance is being performed a municipality may institute measures to facilitate these efforts and the first step towards meeting this permit requirement is a thorough review of the maintenance plan submitted with a development or redevelopment application we also uh, covered in this presentation the three elements of a maintenance plan, and those are information, planning, and education. And I've also shown you uh, where guidance and field manual templates can be found on our website. So again, use these as a reference if you need help or need answers. So thanks again, and um, I work with Manesh. Um, you haven't seen my contact information, but you can um, contact Manesh and he'll pass it on to me or vice versa. Um, up next will be Kristen. Um, and if you have further questions, of course, you can type them out in the chat um, or um, just send me an email. Um, we'll get you, uh, if it's a long one, then obviously please email it to the DWQ email address. Uh, if not, Manesh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you a more formal answer there. All right, so up next is Kristen from the MS4 unit, and she will take you through the mapping presentation. All right, thanks, Lisa. Good afternoon, oh, everyone. You're welcome. My name is Kristen Jeske, and I'm, I'm an environmental specialist in the Municipal Stormwater Permitting Unit. Today, as Lisa said, I'll be speaking about the stormwater infrastructure mapping requirements of the MS4 permits and what kind of tools we've created here at the department to assist permittees in meeting those requirements. The Bureau of Najipti Stormwater Permitting and Water Quality Management issues three separate stormwater general permits to public entities across the state. Those permits are the Tier A Municipal Permit, the Public Complex Permit, and the highway agency permit. The tier A permit has the mo most permittees with each of the 557 towns in the state being permitted after all 101 tier B towns were reassigned to tier A's as of July, 2022. Each of the three permits has its own set of mapping requirements. So let's discuss those requirements in more detail. The previous Tier A permit iteration from 2018 required municipalities to develop and maintain an outfall pipe map. Outfall pipe maps were initially due to the department on January 1, 2019 in any format. Tier A municipalities were also required to submit an electronic form of their outfall pipe map to the department by December 21st of 2020. The acceptable electronic formats included submitting an ESRI geo database, an ESRI shapefile, an AutoCAD file, the DEP Excel template, or by using the DEP ArcGIS online mapping tool. As of our last check, we have roughly 85 to 90 percent of the Tier A outfall pipe maps submitted, and we're working with the municipalities to get the rest submitted. Additionally, the 2018 permit required Tier A municipalities to maintain an inventory of all stormwater facilities that they own or operate. The inventory must include the location information as well as information about each facility. While this is not required to be submitted to the department, it is subject to be reviewed during routine compliance inspections and audits. Tier A municipalities shall also ensure the responsible parties of stormwater facilities not owned or operated by the Tier A municipality perform their required maintenance. The permit condition requires municipalities maintain a log sufficient to demonstrate compliance with the maintenance requirements of all privately owned or operated stormwater facilities. The log is required to show the actions taken by the municipality to enforce maintenance. For example, 
the town can send a notice to the responsible parties requiring maintenance of their stormwater basins. And the log is also required to show the location information of the facility that was subject to the maintenance action. Without the location information, it is not demonstrating completely that the municipality has actually enforced the maintenance requirements on those privately owned facilities. We feel that you, if you don't know where your facilities are, you cannot make sure that they are being properly maintained and enforcement actions are taken against those responsible parties that are failing to maintain their basins. Building off of the required inventory logs, the 2023 TRA permit now requires municipalities to complete an MS4 infrastructure map. Mapping is an entirely new requirement for the new tier A towns, but original tier A towns do not get an extension on the requirement to have submitted an electronic outfall pipe map to the department by December 21st of 2020, as was outlined in the 2018 permit. The acceptable electronic formats, again, include submitting an ESRI geo database, ESRI shapefile, an AutoCAD file, the DEP Excel template, or by using the DEP ArcGIS online mapping tool. MS4 infrastructure includes MS4 outfalls, MS4 groundwater discharge points, MS4 interconnections, storm drain inlets, MS4 manholes, MS4 conveyance, MS4 pump stations, stormwater facilities, and the property boundaries of all maintenance yards and other ancillary operations. The map needs to be reviewed annually to account for any new or newly identified MS4 infrastructure and needs to be posted on the permittee's dedicated stormwater webpage. The public complex permit covers facilities such as universities, prisons, military bases, hospitals, and other large publicly owned facilities. Their mapping requirements are similar to that of the 2018 Tier A permit. Public complexes are required to develop an outfall pipe map that was initially due to the department on January 1st of 2020 in any format, and then they were required to submit the outfall pipe map in an electronic format by December 21st of 2020. Public complexes are also required to create an inventory and map of the stormwater facilities that are listed here on the slide. So that includes storm drain inlets, stormwater management basins, subsurface infiltration and detention systems, culverts, manufactured treatment devices, and green infrastructure. The stormwater facilities inventory and map was required to be submitted to the department on January 1st of 2020 and be maintained and kept up to date in an electronic format as we've previously discussed. The highway agency permit covers the highway and bridge commissions across the state, such as the NJDOT, the Garden State Parkway, and the highway agencies in each county. Similar to the TRA and public complex permit, the highway agencies were required to submit an outfall pipe map to the department in an electronic format by December 21st of 2020. Highway agencies also have the same stormwater facility map and inventory requirements as the public complexes. They must develop and maintain a map and inventory of the listed stormwater facilities. So again, that includes storm drain inlets, stormwater management basins, subsurface infiltration and detention systems, culverts, manufactured treatment devices, and green infrastructure. The difference here is that highway agencies had until January 1st of 2023 to submit their stormwater facility inventory and map to the department in an electronic format. To this point, we've had some decent submittal rates and we continue to work with our permittees to help get their outfall pipe maps and stormwater facilities inventories and maps submitted. The mapping requirements weren't just added to the MS4 permits because we like to look at dots on a map. Mapping and inventorying of your stormwater facilities is crucial to conducting the required inspections and maintenance in each permit. The MS4 permits require permittees to inspect for stream scouring at their outfall pipes. And here are two examples of bad scouring cases at different outfalls. Stream scouring is the erosion or removal of stream bed or bank material by the physical action of flowing water and the sediment that it carries. Scouring can lead to the damage of physical structures that requires expensive maintenance or replacement. 
Here's a summary of the stream scouring requirements from each of the MS4 permits. The mapping of outfalls is greatly assist, assists in meeting these requirements. TRAs have to inspect each of their outfalls for stream scouring once every five years. Public complexes and highway agencies have to inspect each of their outfalls once annually for stream scouring. Illicit discharge inspections are also greatly assisted by mapping and inven inventorying of stormwater features. Here's an example of an illicit discharge occurring at a municipal outfall. Tracing back to upstream inlets showed that the runoff from fertilized lawns with sprinkler systems was causing a dry weather flow that was high in nutrients at this outfall. This issue could be resolved easily due to the availability of the outfall and inlet locations on the municipality's inventory and map. Illicit discharges are any non-stormwater discharge through a stormwater outfall. The easiest way to find an illicit discharge is to inspect an outfall three days after the last rain event and look for a flow. While this flow could be groundwater infiltration into the system, in many cases, it is evidence of an illicit discharge and is most likely contaminating the waterway that the outfall discharges to. Here are the illicit discharge requirements from each of the MS4 permits. It's important to note that any illicit discharges that are found must be remediated and reported to the department. TRAs and highway agencies have to inspect each of their outfalls for illicit discharges once every five years, and public complexes have to inspect each of their outfalls once annually for illicit discharges. Stormwater facilities maintenance is probably the most important reason to inventory and map your stormwater facilities. Most of the calls that we receive are complaints related to failing stormwater facilities. Ponding water, odor, mosquitoes, and flooding all get called into the department on a regular basis. Many times the permittee was unaware that the basin existed or that the cleaning and maintenance was their responsibility. Keeping an up-to-date facilities map and inventory helps to alleviate this problem and helps permittees schedule and conduct re regular cleaning and maintenance. Here's an example of a basin where the ownership was unknown and therefore the cleaning and maintenance was neglected. So the lack of cleaning and maintenance turned this basin into a pond that was complete with aquatic vegetation and wildlife. All MS4 permittees are required to develop, update, and implement a program to ensure the adequate long-term cleaning, operation, and maintenance of all permittee-owned or operated stormwater facilities. Municipalities are required to ensure the adequate long-term cleaning, operation, and maintenance of all stormwater facilities that are not owned or operated by the municipality, but are located within its borders. So now that we've gone through now that we've gone through all of the permit requirements and reasons to map, I'll get into how the department is assisting permittees with mapping. The department has created a geodatabase template and associated data dictionary for seven stormwater features. So those features currently include outfall pipes, stormwater management basins, subsurface infiltration and detention features, manufactured treatment devices, green infrastructure, storm drain inlets, and culverts. We felt that these features were all easily collected as point features and would be a great starting point to mapping your stormwater system. The feature classes are currently being updated to account for the newly required MS4 infrastructure mapping requirements of the TRA permit. Not every permittee operates in the same manner or has the same technological capabilities, so the geodatabase template that we created had to be made available over a number of different collection methodologies in order to suit the needs of all of our permittees. The first method that was created was a mapping tool using ArcGIS Online. This program allows you to collect points and associated information on a tablet, smartphone, or computer. The department has secured a pool of free licenses that are for use by our permittees, and they're available upon request. Data that's collected will be stored in a database, in our database, and can be downloaded at any time, as I will discuss a little bit later on. The app that is used for collecting points through ArcGIS Online is called ArcGIS Field Maps, and it can be accessed through both the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. Some of you may be familiar with the previous version of the app that was called Collector, 
Um, that app is no longer in use, and this new version, ArcGIS Field Maps, is the, the new version. The app itself is free to use once you have a license from the department, and then you can begin mapping. So once downloaded, the user can collect points by using the mobile device's GPS or by manually placing points on an aerial background. When a point is placed, a list of descriptive attributes will show up and can be filled out. This helps in determining things such as the type of basin or MTD that you mapped, which is important when conducting maintenance. This also helps to determine who is responsible for what facility. And most fields within the app have a drop down menu like you see here that make it easy to fill out and less time consuming than typing out each attribute while you're in the field. The next method that was created was a template for GPS devices. Some of our permittees have access to these devices, and if money was spent to acquire one, we did not want that money to be wasted. A template for the GPS devices can be downloaded from the website and uploaded to the device. And this template is an exact replica of the one that's used in the ArcGIS Online tool. For those users who are already familiar with ArcMap or ArcPro, we also developed a geodatabase that can be downloaded from our website. That geodatabase can be populated on the computer and submitted back to the department to meet the mapping requirements. Again, everything here has drop down menus, which makes it user friendly. The final method that is available for download from our website is a Microsoft Excel template. This template is populated with the same fields and drop downs as the other templates. However, point coordinates, so latitude and longitude, would have to be manually entered into the spreadsheet before you submit it back to us. This template would also satisfy the electronic submission requirement. As the department receives our permittees stormwater infrastructure data, we are making it available to all permittees and the public in a public facing layer that's managed by our Bureau of GIS. Stormwater infrastructure data points that have been submitted to the department are given a preliminary view review for quality control and then posted to the NJDEP open data website for viewing and download. If you're unfamiliar with the site, a simple browser search for NJDEP open data will take you right to it. And from there, you can search for data that's made available publicly by the department. As we continue to review submitted data and we receive new submissions, we will continuously post the data to the site. And if for some reason you've noticed errors in the data that you submitted by reviewing it on the open data site, please reach out to us and we can work together to get that data corrected. Another good resource for you for permittees to use to get stormwater infrastructure information and location is the Rutgers HNH database. Uh, the link for that database is here on the slide. This website contains the location and information of any stormwater management basin that has been reviewed by the soil conservation districts. And this is a great starting point for those looking to find the location of their basins. In summary, NJDEP has created a database and data dictionary for the seven stormwater infrastructure features required to be mapped by MS4 permittees, and it is currently being updated to account for the new mapping requirements of the 2023 TRA permit. The data dictionary was made available over a number of different collection methodologies to suit the needs of all permittees, and existing data can be accessed via NJDEP open data. And lastly, the department is willing to provide assistance in the form of training or by answering any questions you may have. So please reach out if you need any assistance along the way. So that wraps up the mapping portion of today's module. Um, if you have any questions after today's session, my email address is here on the slide. Um, please feel free to email me. Um, but in the meantime, do we have any questions specific to mapping either in the chat or does anybody want to ask any specific mapping questions live? Uh, there are some technical uh, questions regarding the mapping, but I think it might be better to, uh, I would refer that to team uh, okay. and he then uh, they can have a, f a further uh, detailed discussion. Yep, that's perfect. Thanks, Changi. Um, so if there's no general mapping questions, then we can continue to move on, I guess. 
Um, so that was the last presentation of the day. So up next is going to be quiz one, which is going to be led by Anthony Roblick. So please stand by while Anthony takes control. Um, someone from the staff is going to paste the QR code and the link in the chat for the quiz. So I know this was mentioned earlier, but if you decide to take the quiz on your computer, make sure you open the link in a new window or tab so that you still stay in the Teams meeting or you can also use your smartphone to scan the QR code and take the quiz on your smartphone. So thanks again for all of your attention, everyone. Uh, we are taking a 10 minutes break, so please come back um, at 3.11. Uh, Thank you.
OK, I uh, hope everyone is back from their break. Um, so now it's time for a brief quiz. My name is Anthony Roblick, and I'm with the Municipal Stormwater Engineering Unit at the DEP. Uh, this will be quiz one, and there will be a quiz administered at the end of each module. Uh, and since the course is organized over four modules, we'll have a total of four quizzes. And uh, all four quizzes must be completed by attendees who wish to receive either the CPC credits, if you're a PE, um, and, and we'll issue those for attending the course in whole, um, or a uh, certificate of course completion. And <clears throat> the, uh, the purpose of these quizzes is really twofold. Uh, so they serve as a, a benchmark to guide your understanding of some of the material that we covered in each module. Um, but they also serve as a useful benchmark for us and how well we deliver the course material, as particularly if the, uh, the material is new to the course. So with that, uh, let's move on to how to navigate to the quiz. Um, so the quiz is hosted on SurveyMonkey, and there are a few ways to get there. Uh, the easiest is accessing the quiz using a smartphone, uh, in which case, you can scan the QR code on the slide here. Um, it's also posted or should be posted in the chat. Um, and, and that will take you directly to quiz one. Uh, you can also access the quiz from your web browser through the, the URL that's also posted in the chat. Um, if, however, you wish to access the quiz from our website, uh, first, you want to navigate to our training web page with the stormwater handouts address noted here. Um, and I believe this address was was also included in the invitation for this module. And once you navigate to our training web page, you'll want to scroll down to the bottom of the page um, where you'll see links to all of all of the uh, four quizzes. Um, and at this time, only quiz one will open uh, will be open. So you'll want to select quiz one. But um, either method, whatever you choose, um, once you once you get to quiz one, you should be um, you should see a title that looks like this should should read as spring 2023 stormwater training uh, quiz one. Uh, so here again is the QR code uh, as well as the survey monkey URL, and we'll leave this slide up while you're taking the quiz. Um, the quiz is made up of 19 questions over a few pages, and you must answer every question on a page before being allowed to advance to the, the next page. Uh, and the quiz may only be taken once. And after everyone has taken the quiz, we'll meet back to review all of the uh, correct answers. Um, right now it's 316, and I think we're going to allot uh, 20 minutes to take the quiz. So we'll meet back here for review at uh, 3.36. Six.
Okay, uh, welcome back. <clears throat> uh, it's been about 20 minutes since we started the quiz and looks like we're up to about 95% uh, completion rate. So we can go ahead and begin the review. And uh, afterwards, if we have some time, we can take any additional questions at the end. All right, so we'll start with question four. Uh, the six minimum measures are required by what type of mandate? And the answer to this is A, federal. So this is something that uh, Hannah covered in the federal background presentation. Uh, the the uh, NIPTES phase two stormwater regulations require the six minimum measures to be implemented for small MS4s. Uh, so this is mandated at the federal level. Question five, reviewing site plans is required to comply with which statewide basic requirement? And the answer to this is C, post-construction stormwater management. So it's, uh, it's part of the stormwater basic requirements that the permittee develop, update, implement, and enforce its stormwater management program to address stormwater runoff from both new development and redevelopment. Question six, who is the responsible party or who is responsible for enforcing the post-construction stormwater management program? And the answer to this is D, the MS4 permittee. Uh, so this is kind of linked to the previous question, uh, and it's a, uh, it's a responsibility of the MS4 permittee to enforce the post-construction stormwater management program. Moving on to question seven. So what is the definition of a major development under the Municipal Stormwater Control Ordinance? And the answer to this is B. All development projects that result in land disturbance of one acre or more and any additional development defined as major development by a municipality's stormwater control ordinance. And uh, this is pursuant to NJAC 7-8-4.2. It's for the purposes of a municipal stormwater management plan and elements, uh, and that includes the SEO. Uh, major, major development is defined as, as B. Okay, question eight, which of these can be used to demonstrate compliance with the water quantity design and performance standard? The answer to this is B, design stormwater management measures so that the post-construction peak runoff rates for the 2, 10, and 100-year storm events are 50, 75, and 80% respectively of the pre-construction peak runoff rates. Question nine, uh, which of the following is the New Jersey water quality design storm? And the answer to this is A. And so the New Jersey water quality design storm is a storm event uh, with a variable intensity that results in one and a quarter inches of rainfall over two hours. Okay, next question 10. Uh, which of the following meets the groundwater recharge standard? And the answer to this is D, all of the above. So a, uh, a major development has the option of infiltrating the either the, the increase in the two year design storm runoff volume or maintaining the average annual groundwater recharge. Uh, and we have the groundwater recharge spreadsheet available on our, on our website in order to assist the site in, in meeting that second option. Um, the exception is if a site is within an urban redevelopment area, uh, PA1, and is fully developed or, or portions of the site are fully developed, uh, then the groundwater recharge requirement would not apply uh, to those portions of the site. Okay, question 11, true or false? 
a project located in a tidal flood hazard area is always exempt from the water quantity standard? And the answer to this is, of course, B, false. So in a uh, in tidal flood hazard areas, uh, the water quantity standard does not apply uh, only if the applicant can demonstrate that the increased volume of stormwater runoff will not increase flood damage below the point of discharge. Uh, so there must be a, a demonstration through a uh, hydrologic and hydraulic analysis uh, that the increased volume, uh, the change in timing, or the increased rate of runoff or combination of those uh, will not result in additional flood damage below the point of discharge. Um, and the only time when that analysis would not be required is if the discharge is directly into the ocean um, or bay, inlet, or, or reach of any water course between its confluence with one of those water bodies and the uh, first upstream water control structure. Okay, question 12, another true or false. Uh, BMPs from table 5.2 uh, can be used to meet the stormwater quality requirements without obtaining a waiver or variance from NJAC 7.8-5.3, which are the, uh, the GI standards. And the answer to this is B, false. So a waiver or variance is required in order to use BMPs from table 5.2 for stormwater runoff quality uh, or groundwater recharge. BMPs from table 5.2 may only be used to meet the stormwater runoff quantity requirement without a waiver of variance. Okay, question 13, true or false? The gravel area used for vehicle parking during events that are regularly held should be considered a motor vehicle surface. And the answer to this is true. So a surface that is intended to be used by motor vehicles beyond an emergency situation should be considered as part of the total motor vehicle surface. Um, however, if a surface does not allow for, for motor vehicle use outside of an emergency, um, that the reviewing agency may, may determine that the area can be excluded from the total uh, regulated motor vehicle surface. Okay, question 14, which of the following is required in a maintenance plan? And the answer to this is D, all of the above. So uh, Manesh covered this in the maintenance presentation. Uh, the maintenance plan must include preventative and corrective maintenance tasks uh, specific to the BMPs used on site, uh, the name, address, and phone number of the responsible party and must also include uh, cost estimates. Okay, question 15, which of the following cannot be the responsible party for maintenance of a stormwater BMP? The answer to this is D. So a homeowner that owns only one home in a large residential development. Uh, the stormwater management rules at NGAC 7.8-5.8C state that responsibility for maintenance shall not be assigned or transferred to the owner or tenant of an individual property in a residential development or project uh, unless it's the rare case where uh, the owner or tenant owns or leases the entire residential development or project. And I think Chengi uh, in the chat earlier pointed out the uh, the only really the only other exception, which is if if a single lot in and of itself is a major development and has a uh, BMP for stormwater management on its site. OK, question 16, um, at a minimum. How often is the responsible party required to evaluate the effectiveness of the maintenance plan? The answer to this is C. So 
So the stormwater management rules state that the responsible party must evaluate the effectiveness of the maintenance plan at least once per year and adjust the plan as needed. Okay, question 17, another true or false. All maintenance plans for stormwater management measures must be recorded on the deed of record for each property on which the maintenance must be undertaken if the responsible party is not a public agency. And the answer to this is A, true. So NJAC 7-8-5.8B, states that if the person responsible for maintenance is not a public agency, uh, the maintenance plan and any future revisions shall be recorded upon the deed of record for each property on which the maintenance must be undertaken. A question 18, true or false? You must purchase a handheld GPS unit, such as a Trimble GPS unit, to complete the MS4 mapping requirements. The answer to this is false. Uh, so you don't have to purchase an expensive handheld GPS unit to do the mapping. Uh, with the mapping app that was developed by the DEP, uh, you can use your smartphone, a tablet, um, or even a laptop to get the coordinates you need to complete the mapping. Uh, so no need to purchase a Trimble. Um, <clears throat> if you have one, that's great. You could use that. Um, but otherwise, there are other options for you to use. OK, uh, question 19, another true or false. Uh, the department charges MS4 permittees a small monthly fee to use the ArcGIS online mapping tool. And the answer to this is B, false. So the online mapping tool is available uh, free of charge through the department. Uh, the department has purchased uh, licenses. And uh, if you need a license to use the mapping app, um, you can contact Tim Ebersberger, whose uh, I think contact information is posted in the chat. Um, you can just shoot him an email to sign. He can sign you up for that. Um, or you can contact uh, Kristen. Okay, hey, that's the end of the quiz review.